This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the legendary production designer, art director, Joe Alves. Joe, of course, designed Bruce the Shark for the Jaws movies, and he even directed Jaws 3. He also um, worked on Close Encounters of the Third Kind, celebrating its 45th anniversary. He also um, worked on John Carpenter's Escape from New York and Starman. Um, he worked on Night Gallery, um, Alfred Hitchcock's Torn Curtain. I mean, he's had just a huge career. He started out uh, working on Forbidden Planet, the 1956 sci-fi cult classic for MGM. And I think he did a little work for Disney, um, uh, specifically on Sleeping Beauty. And uh, I'm going to get into all of that stuff today. And um, it's going to be great. I've been wanting him on here since day one, but was never able to connect until Curtis Lanklos, the host of Retro Zest Podcast and guest of this show, connected us. Thank you so much, Curtis. I truly appreciate it, man. This is the last interview for Thankful November, and it's been a great month. I have a lot to be thankful for. Also, rest in peace, Christine, Mc, Christine McVie. She was the blonde British lady in Fleetwood Mac, and she had a great, a great voice just as much as Stevie Nicks. The way she sang Tell Me, Tell Me Lies, Tell Me Sweet Little Lies is just haunting. She had just a wonderful, wonderful voice. So rest in peace, Christine McVie. So yeah, here is my interview with Joe Alves. First of all, I'd like to say this is such a great honor. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, no problem. So, I guess mm -hmm. little projects I'm doing, I, I was just sort of in the middle of it, but I'm fine. I've got, it's, it's sort of, I don't know, weird for a guy that did Jaws to have fish <laughs> in his living room, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, going back in time, I know that uh, you grew up loving animation and you drew cartoons and illustrated and so forth. What uh, what were the early cartoons you watched that you enjoyed? Oh, well, early cartoons, I mean, you got to figure out when I was born. We didn't have uh, uh, television then right. when I was a little kid. Uh I mean, obviously the comic books, but uh, that's, uh, I guess, I guess uh, you know, I watch obviously the Disney movies. Right. Uh, Bambi uh, was one of my favorites. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. So it was mostly movies because the, 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 the Fifties is when the kid cartoons come out, and I, I graduated high school in '53, mm -hmm. so I, I wasn't into that so much. Yeah, you had to go to the theaters to uh, see Disney and Looney Tunes and all of that. Yeah, so those are the ones that I saw, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. and obviously, you know, Dumbo and Pinocchio and all those old classics. Uh, I. Uh, I started drawing from the time I was really young, I mm -hmm. mean, four or five years old. And when I was in the fourth grade, I remember I did all the dwarfs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, about a foot tall, and teacher put them on the wall, I did all the seven dwarfs. So that was a big uh, movie for me, Snow White. Do, do you remember the first movie you ever saw? No. Okay. Um, uh, you're talking about going back a long way. Yeah. <laughs> How about the first movie you saw that made you wanted to work in the film business? Uh, American in Paris. Oh, that's a good one. I'll tell you what. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, uh, I was like 14, and uh, there was a little theater down the street in Hayward, mm -hmm. and uh, I went with the girl that lived a couple blocks away. We were good friends. And we walked down at night and saw the uh, Gene Kelly, Leslie Caron, Dan 
dancing. And so we sort of danced our way back. And then I realized, or I found out, that they never shot it in Paris. They shot the whole thing on the back lot on sets at MGM. And then I realized who did that. Well, it was Cedric Gibbons and an art director, and, and they were responsible for creating that look. And at that time, I thought, that's what I want to do. Because I could always draw, and I also played the piano, and I had a little group uh, that we would go play for the Kiwanis and stuff like that. So uh, I was interested in art and music, but I realized if I wanted to be a art director, I'd have to study architecture, because that's basically what it was. Mm -hmm. So... That was my, when I went to college, I majored in architecture and I minored in drama because I wanted the theatrical aspects of it. And uh, so eventually, uh, this was in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Hayward. That's where I'm from. And, I'm from San Mateo. Oh, okay. So I went to San Jose State uh, for a year and uh, then I kept thinking I was driving from Hayward to... to uh, San Jose, and I kept thinking, someday I got to make that turn and go down to Los Angeles because that's where movies are made. And I had a cousin that lived down there who was an architect, and uh, he gave me a lot of advice on studying architecture. And then I found an art school called Chenard's, which is now Cal Arts, mm -hmm. and uh, they did have production design classes, and so I that's I studied that for that year and uh, do you want me to keep going how this went yeah like did, did that lead to Forbidden Planet what happened was this is very very strange mm -hmm. I, I belonged I joined a fraternity at San Jose and I had some fraternity brothers and at the end of the second year when I was going to Chenard's I really wanted to find a job down in L.A. and not have to go back to the Bay Area. But I went back and I saw some friends, and one of the members of the uh, fraternity, actually he was the president, uh, he said his, his wife's father works at Disney, uh, Andy England, and uh, maybe you can get a job with him. And I thought, well, you know, I'm not ready for doing the artwork or whatever there, but uh, maybe I can get a job sweeping up or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I called him, and it just so happened. He, what luck, he was the guy that did the hiring for the artists. And he said, well, would you bring the portfolio? And I, I said, well, I, I don't know if I'm ready yet. You know, he said, no, no, well, let's look at it. So I brought a portfolio of my work at the, at the arts, uh, Sir Arts, and uh, he said, "Okay, this is this is good." I said, he said, "But you're too late for the the training sy uh, system that they had. Uh, you start off, and you have a training program. They pay you like forty nine dollars a week for mm -hmm. a few weeks or months, and, and they teach you how to draw Mickey Mouse and things like that." He said, yeah. "But you're too late for that. So, but I could put you in to uh, special effects." Uh, drawing water and fire and stuff like that. I said, really? Okay. So the next day, I went down to the, the section that did uh, uh, special effects, and there was this woman, she had a room there called Marion, and they said, well, you work with Marion. So Marion uh, worked, was working with Dwight Carlisle, who was, working for Josh Metter. So the way it worked is basically you start as a training trainer, then you go to an in-betweener, mm -hmm. and you're in-betweener for a couple of years, and then you're lucky to become a breakdown artist, and then from a breakdown artist, you become an assistant animator, and then an animator, and, and this takes years. I mean, it takes years to go through that whole process. And there were guys there that had been there since Snow White, yeah. you know, for for years. Anyway, so she, I said, what do I do? And I sat, she sat me down in front of this table with a light on it and papers that had three holes. She says, you put the papers down, you flip these three papers and you draw in between those two. And that's what an in-betweener does. So mm -hmm. 
she started me off as an in-betweener. Yeah. And uh, and then what happened was she had to go to place. She had to leave the studio. Uh, so she said, "Well, you just work for Dwight." So then now now I'm just working for Dwight Carlisle, who's an assistant. So now after a few weeks, I'm now doing breakdown work. You know, uh, they just skipped me right in. And they had this this. Uh, Forbidden Planet they had uh, from MGM they were doing this thing called the id mm -hmm. and it was it was different sized paper because it was uh, like uh, a Panavis but not quite Panavis but, but but white mm -hmm. and they didn't want to ink and paint it they were, so you had to render each frame so there was this monster so I was working for Dwight breaking down his his stuff and after about a month, he had to go in the hospital. And mm. so now I'm promoted. I'm after less than three months. I'm now working as an assistant animator. It yeah. just was crazy. And I skipped so many years. A lot of people resented it, but I started working for Dwight, and he was very, very uh, important at Disney. He, he he did the fire in in, in Bambi. He did the night in Bald Mountain. He he was just the best effects animator. And we became friends and I was assisting him. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't want to say anything about it because he was happy with that. So that was that was unbelievable. I went from <laughs> from nothing to an assistant animator working on the id mm -hmm. in a uh, three three months or four months. Did, that was my beginning in the industry. That, did you know Phil Roman? Pardon? Did you know Phil Roman? Did I know Phil Roman? Yeah. Uh, no. Why, what was, uh, he, was he, he was there? He, he was an animator at Disney in those early days. Yeah, he, he did uh, animation on Sleeping Beauty, and then he went on to do the Charlie Brown specials and Dr. Sue stuff. Yeah. yeah. I worked on Sleeping Beauty. You know, he was a character animator. Uh -huh. So I really had, had not much dealing with him. What I, I was doing was just the effects. And I had a very, very odd situation. I was working on Sleeping Beauty, you know? You know they made me an assistant mm -hmm. animator. And uh, it was uh, the, uh, the fairies. One of the fairies was holding a cookie. Right. And I was drawing the cookie, and somebody reached over my shoulder and said, no, the cookie should look like this. And he made it look like mouse ears, and it was Walt Disney. And Walt would come around and correct your drawings and talk to you, and he, you had to call him Walt, you didn't call him Mr. Disney. So that was, uh, thinking about it over the years, quite an achievement to have mm -hmm. Walt Disney reach over my shoulder and correct the drawing, you know. Yeah, I, I think that movie holds up. It didn't look like anything Disney had done before or since. It's just beautifully drawn. One of the most be beautiful, beautiful uh, Disney films, I think. Yeah, there was a, 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 one of the main characters fought these these reeds. Uh, there were, uh, how do I put it, with thorns in it. And mm -hmm. it was a, a big sequence where he was fighting. And, and I worked on, on that. So I did a lot of uh, different effects for that movie. It was a beautiful, it was a different style than uh, uh, formula, uh, different, you know, Disney movies, I think. Yeah. And uh, I talked to James Drury two weeks before he passed, and he told me that Forbidden Planet was the one movie he did that he was the most proud of, and he said it was a great experience. So was that a, a great experience? Was there a feeling that that movie would become a classic? It was uh, an incredible uh, movie for the time, you know. You've, mm -hmm. That was 1955 that I was working on it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I did know, but you know, I'm, we're talking about how many years? Sixty something years ago, you know. Yeah. I, I I remember. I don't know. Did he work in special effects? Is that what he said? No, no, he was an actor. Oh, he's an actor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, who is this? You, you mentioned James Drury. He went on to be oh. the Virginian. Yeah, 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 yeah. James Drury. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about the the uh, animator again. Oh no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, how was working with Hitchcock on Torn Curtain? That was uh, an, an, 
another fortunate situation uh, because that was uh, in live action. And uh, let's see, so that was 1965. So I'm talking 10 years later mm -hmm. from doing. Uh, and what happened is uh, I. I really, after a couple of years at Disney's, I really wanted to do live action. And I, I didn't want to do the, uh, you know, the animation anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, a friend of mine uh, that uh, I went to college with, he, he was, uh, he majored in, he actually directed a play when I was at San Jose. Anyway, he came to, uh, to Hollywood at, uh, after he worked in the, uh, the service, uh, and he he was directing plays at the Hollywood Playhouse, and uh, so I started working there and doing live uh, sets, and I developed a portfolio of various sets that we we did, and so then I finally got a job as a set designer. Now there's another situation that you start as a junior set designer, and uh, you keep. There was a studio system. It was very different because they had, what, six, seven major studios, Paramount, MGM, Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. And before you found a home, like if you were a junior set designer, you would be the last to be hired and the first to be fired, and they kept the regular people. So, I mean, I worked on uh, Mutiny on the Bounty, the, the one was... Uh, uh, Marlon Brando, and I worked on the ship, and I worked on My Fair Lady at Warner Brothers, doing just little odds and ends things. And so I got knocked around until I got a job at Universal. Mm -hmm. uh, I became a senior set designer, and uh, I was doing uh, it's uh, it's it's a mad 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 world for Stanley Kramer. Yeah. So th at that point, then I started doing drawings, set designs, and uh, uh, model making, and so that that's another thing. In live action, there's three different unions. There's a set designers union that basically does the drafting, the architectural drafting. There is the uh, illustrators union that do the storyboards and illustrations, and then you become an art director. That's another union. Mm -hmm. So. The, you know, the younger guys all wanted to become art directors. And after uh, a couple of years, I was fortunate to become an art director, assistant art director. And I worked with Sky Frank Arrigo, who is very knowledgeable. Uh, and uh, so we did the Hitchcock show. And Hitch was a very interesting guy. He would, uh, <laughs> everybody wore, he wore black suits and black ties mm -hmm. and we had to wear sport coats and ties at that time and uh so every every morning we'd meet on the set at the coffee machine there and uh hitchcock would be there with the art director and the production manager and he would tell very unfunny jokes and yeah. <laughs> we were supposed to laugh and, but here's an interesting thing. Yeah. So, uh, Hein Heckloff was production designer. They brought him from Germany to do the ballet sequence because he won the Academy Award for the Red Shoes mm -hmm. many years before. Really nice guy. And Frank Arrigo uh, worked with him on a number of things. And uh, so it was Frank and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the German production designer. And uh, they were out of the studio for some reason, location looking or something. And uh, Peggy Hitchcock's assistant called me and said, Mr. Hitchcock wants to see you, Joe. And I said, why me? Why not uh, Frank? Or, no, no, there were, he wants to see you, which was a, a big deal to go to his office and just have a meeting with him alone. And so he, he used to be an art director mm -hmm. from when he was in England. And so he was drawing this thing, and he said, Joe, he says, uh, Mr. Newman, Paul Newman, runs down these stairs, mm -hmm. and you build the stairs. And then Mr. Whitlock, Al Whitlock, will do a, 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 a scenic backdrop that we'll show there. Then, uh, then he comes out of the stairs, and he goes over to the registration desk, 
signs in or out and then leaves. So you build the registration desk. I says, okay, uh, Mr. Hitchcock, what about the reverse shots? What about, you know, no, 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 I, that's all I need. I, and so there's only a few directors that I've ever worked with that knew what they wanted so that you didn't have to build these huge sets, which you never saw. Yeah. Hitchcock would tell you what he was going to shoot, and that's what we built. We didn't build reverse balls if you didn't want one, you know. And uh, so that was very, uh, very different. So a lot of directors, you, you know, I've worked with, uh, they, they don't know exactly. We're going to build a set, big set, and they don't know what they're going to shoot until they get on the set. And so a lot of times they shoot a corner and you built this whole big thing you never see. So uh, Hitchcock was incredible that way. He, he knew what he wanted. And uh, we could limit the building. Also, John Carpenter w was one that could limit the building also. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, so uh, working uh, with his cock on Torn Curtain was an incredible experience, you know. And uh, I got to know yeah. Paul Newman quite well. And uh, because he wanted to race cars, and I was racing cars at the time, form nice. all formula cars. And so we became friends doing that. Nice. Anyway. Um, then you uh, were art director on Rod Zerling's Night Gallery. And um, I, I, I've talked to Rod Zerling's daughter. She told me he didn't have the same creative freedom on that show that he had on Twilight Zone. Uh, did you find that to be so? He, he probably right. Uh, the producer pretty well controlled it. And... Uh, it was quite a, an experience working with Rod. We would see him only when he came to do, uh, photograph the presentation. You know, he would talk about what the sets were going to be. And uh, I had quite an interesting experience with him because uh, we did a thing, uh, a show with Lawrence Harvey. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the director was, as you know, Schwark, who had directed a number of those. And it, it was the most incredible show because I would do tw like 20 sets a week because we would have two or three episodes with different directors. So I had to build sets and I had to deal with with two or three directors each episode, which was just an incredible amount of work. And so... I, I, it was a great experience being a young art director to have a show that had so much different sets in it. And I remember doing this uh, thing with Lawrence Harvey, and uh, and after we were wrapping, he brought some wine because he was a wine collector. And, and then I was sitting there with Jeannot and uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, God, I just forgot who I was talking about. Uh, Rod, uh, Rod Serling? Rod Serling. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, and we were both about the same heights, very, you know, mid five feet, five or six. There were three of us are pretty short. Anyway, I was talking to Rod, and I said, boy, this is amazing. How, how can you write all these shows and you know you're just amazing and he turned to me he says what i do no he says what you do look at all the things he says i write them but you make them happen I mean, <laughs> it's an incredible compliment because he he was not much of a visual guy mm -hmm. he could write but he he really there was so much room in his scripts to go in different directions using you know uh, visually that is mm -hmm. so that was a huge compliment and uh, that was I did three seasons of that and I met so many John Badham Steven Spielberg uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, it, was a, it was quite an experience yeah it was Ross Sterling he was a great guy too right a very nice guy very nice and as I say that it was uh, that was very nice of him to give me that the compliment of, of my work was so important to him. So getting into Jaws, uh, you had worked with Spielberg on Night Gallery and the Sugarland Express, so you two had a comfortable working relationship. Did he recommend you for the job? For 
Jaws? For Jaws, yeah. No, actually, I was on Jaws before Steven. Okay. Uh, what happened was, this was very, I got to tell you, mm-hmm. I, I, I've, I've never seen, I've never known an art director, or I haven't had the position that I got on Jaws. What happened was, I worked with Stephen on uh, two shows called The Psychiatrist, and then a Night Gallery, and then we did Sugarland Express. And that was a, a, a on the road picture. I got to know him pretty well driving all over Texas. But R- Richard Zanuck and David Brown were the producers, and they were heavyweights. They did The Sting and Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid and all these things. So um, I got to know David pretty well. Uh, uh, I mean, Dick pretty well because he traveled with us. David was more the literary guy, and mm-hmm. so he lived in New York, and his wife, Helen Gurley Brown, was the editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine. Mm-hmm. And so what, what happened in those days, the studio system, they would tell you what you're going to do. The head of the art director would say, you're going to do Night to Cali, or you're going to do this television movie they did. Uh, they had these 90-minute features for uh, they were doing on television and anyway i was doing a television movie and it was mostly locations so i'd go in the morning they were shooting some big house and then i'd go back to there mm-hmm. and um, i got a call from david brown it's very unusual mm-hmm. and, and he said joe my wife helen has just read these galley sheets uh from a young writer uh, and uh, it's about a shark that's called Jaws. Uh, Peter Benchley, his, his father and his grandfather were very well-known writers, but this was like his first attempt. And he, she thinks it might make a good movie. So he said he didn't have a charge number. He couldn't pay me. He didn't have, the, they had nothing. He said, could you read the galley sheets and do some illustrations um, so we could sell this to the studio. Now, I don't know if you've ever read my book, Joe Alves, Designing Jaws. I haven't read it yet, no. Well, you can get it on Amazon. Right. Anyway, it it shows all the illustrations that I did and storyboards. So I did about, um, I guess, 20... uh, 11 by 16 charcoal joints of activities, shark activities in the galleys. And uh, I would go over to talk to Stephen just because we're friends. And uh, I would say, this is an interesting movie, Stephen. Uh, And uh, he said, yeah, I'd like to do a pirate movie, though. So anyway, Zanuck and Brown hired this guy, didn't hire him, but interviewed this guy to direct Jaws. And uh, basically, he kept calling it a whale. And mm. it, so, I, I don't know what happened, but I, I was talking to Stephen, and I said, you know, Stephen, if we ever do this, you know, if you get the, you know, get the job, we should do a full-size shark, uh, you know, like being 25 feet, and do it in the real ocean, not in the back lot lake. And he says, absolutely, you know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, basically, I remember the date. It was October 3rd. We had a big meeting. They hired Stephen. Uh, we had a meeting with all the department heads, uh, camera, editing, special effects, art department. Right. And I went up there, and Marshall Green was the head of production. And Marshall liked the idea of doing this movie because he lived on a boat and he just, you know, it was interesting. He liked the whole ocean thing. Anyway, went up to his office and I went through my spiel and said, the shark does this and does that and he says, great, okay, so I finished. And then he turned to the special effects people Mm-hmm. and said, could you build a shark? Because I said, it was really important that we do the shark in the ocean, and it's big. And I started studying with ecthiologists, and they said Leonard Campagna was an ecthiologist, Seinhardt. And he said, a 12-foot 
white shark is the, the best shaped shark. And as they get bigger, they get fatter. Mm -hmm. And you, you're never going to find a shark much bigger than 16 feet. So in any case, Stephen and I decided to double that good-looking 12-foot shark, make it 25. So when Marshall turned to the effects department and said, can you guys build the shark? And they said, no, we've never done a shark in the real ocean. And it would take probably a year and a half to do it and test it. Besides, we've got a bigger movies like the Hindenburg, you know. And Marshall got a little upset and he said, Jaws could be a bigger picture than the Hindenburg. And everybody laughed because this little shark movie is not going to be a big movie. Nobody no. thought this was going to be anything. It was just a, a dumb shark movie. Mm -hmm. So as they were leaving, Marshall called me. I was collecting my drawings. He said, Joe, can you get the shark made? And I'm thinking, being ambitious, you know, I said, I certainly can try, Marshall. He says, okay, but take it out of the lot. Don't do anything here on the lot. And that was very unusual because everything was done in-house, mm -hmm. you know, in their own departments. So basically he gave me total autonomy to find people and build the shark and supervise that aspect, which was pretty well never done, you know, because they go by departments, you should sure be an effects guy. And um, so basically that was it. I went out to talk to various effects guys, I can't remember, no, they did uh, The Godfather, and I went to Disney's, and they said, yeah, they could build it, it would take about a year or more, but they wouldn't take it in the ocean. And then somebody said, you should see this guy, Bob Maddy. He used to be, he did the giant squid in 20,000 leagues under the sea. Mm -hmm. So I met Bob, who was probably in his mid-60s at the time, sort of retired. And he was very enthusiastic. And uh, he said, give me, a, give me a day or so, I'll come back. So in my book, there's a sketch of what he did. It was sort of a wire drawing. And you pull a lever and the mm -hmm. mouth opens up and you push it and it closes. So that's basically, I, we got Bob, then I needed somebody that really knew the latest plastics that would stretch and not break, and that was Roy Abergas, who was making breakaway bottles, and I got him, and I got Richie Helmer, who did the, anyway, I got a, a team of about seven guys, mm -hmm. and we started making the shark uh, down in Sunland, and we, we got a warehouse, and and what Stephen and I did, uh, now the the uh, executives were getting a little interested. And so I had somebody in the art department draw just a, a line drawing of a 20-foot shark and then a 30-foot shark. And we had a meeting with these executives. And uh, so we had a 20, we took them down to this uh, parking lot basement thing and we mm -hmm. put the sharks, two sides, uh, and uh, they looked at it and they said, well, how big do you want the shark? I said, well, what do you guys think? And they said, well, the 20 doesn't look all that big, and 30 looks too big. And I said, how about 25? And they said, oh, that's great. So now we, Stephen and I got the, the permission from the executives, mm -hmm. the okay, to build a 25-foot shark. Now, just quickly, I'll go through this. Okay. Uh, the that was probably I say October November we started putting the crew together I I had somebody uh, doing drawings I found a set designer that was on the lot there who had worked at Lockheed so he's a really good engineer put him with with Bob some of his technical drawings are on in my book now that was November uh, we didn't really start building the shark till late November. The book came out in February of 74, mm -hmm. and we started working on it in late 73. So when the book came out, the studio said, oh, this is very successful. We've got to start shooting this in a couple months. And I went to them, I said, wait a minute, we're supposed to have a 
year, year and a half to build the shark. We just, that, that only gives us a few months. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to start shooting it. And uh, Stephen got to, to delay a, a little bit. But, I mean, it was just unbelievable. They, they didn't even think about what we had to go through. So when we were, we had three sharks, one that moved right to left, and one to left to right, and one that was on a crane. I would go to Bob and I would say, Bob, how are you doing? You got anything working? He said, maybe the left to right. Now, so we had to shoot everything in the movie without a shark first to just eat up the time. And poor Steve was through. He had to shoot a beach sequence in Martha's Vineyard, freezing cold, in the end of April, early part of May. And we, we shot that, but no shark. And then... I was doing storyboards. I did something like 200 storyboards. And so I would say, Stephen, the left to right sharks work. And so we look at the storyboard. Okay, we'll do these three sequences. And uh, I said, if it, if it works, shoot it. If it if it doesn't, it's just a test. And so that's basically what happened when people say we didn't use a shark as much or a shark ever worked. It was just totally not true. We just didn't have the time to develop it. Right. What I love about Jaws is that while it does have this monster movie element with uh, with the shark and everything, I love how um, Brody, Hooper, and Quint, they have this, this male bonding relationship that's almost like an old-timey Western film. And Spielberg being the movie buff that he is, he was probably conscious of that while they were filming. Yeah. The, the relationship, I saw it recently in a big theater because I went to see Jaws in, in 3D, mm -hmm. which is interesting because I directed a 3D Jaws movie. Yes. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was huge. I hadn't seen it in a big screen. And I was extremely impressed with the acting. The relationship that, uh, it, you know, you had Dreyfus in and the Quinn character, you know, Robert Shaw, and their relationship. And then for the Brody character, who was so intense, you know, and what was the problem, and, you know, you, you know, gotta close the beaches and stuff. So I, I was very impressed, uh, because when I had seen Jaws before, I was mainly concerned with the things that I did. Was the shark working, or was gonna, you know, and another thing, some of the critics, I, I love these critics, because they think they know more about the movie than people that worked on the movie. Yeah. And I, I have these critics say, no, you used, uh, uh, you didn't use uh, the shark as much because you, you used barrels. I said, we used the barrels like Hitchcock would uh, to say there's a barrel and the shark is down there. And he can't go down with one or two, and he can. And so every time you saw a barrel, you knew the shark was there. So we didn't want to overuse the shark. It was working. We, we, if you look at my storyboards, we got every shark shot that we had, that I had sketched, you know? Yeah. Um, did you lobby to direct Jaws 3D? No. No, no. What happened was, uh, I worked on Jaws 2. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, what happened is Stephen had, uh, something that he wanted to do, I'm trying to think what it was, uh, 1941. Yeah. And, uh, he, he said, uh, uh, you know, well, would you, I'd like you to do 1941. So I, I read it, I was breaking it down. Is that you buzzing me or what? I don't hear a buzz. Oh, anyway, um, Zanuck and Brown approached me with the idea of doing a sequel of Jaws, and they really wanted me to do it because I, you know, I, I was so involved with Jaws. Actually, I directed a sequence in Jaws, the little kidder boy getting eaten by a shark. Oh, yeah. Because you know, Stephen left, he wanted to go cut. He was getting really tired because he was on the boat. So he said, Joe, you could finish that sequence. So, so I had some experience directing. And so he, they said, we'll make you associate producer, production designer, and second unit director. Uh, so what the hell package that is? I, I, I control everything. So Steven, he said, oh, you don't want to do uh, the sequel. I said, well, this is what they're offering me. It is a lot. He says, I'll do the same thing. I said, okay, well, I'll go with you. He says, well, 
I don't have a deal yet. I said, oh, so when you don't have a deal, you don't have anything, you know. It, it could be or could not be. So I had a lot of pressure to do Jaws too, And uh, so I did. And it was quite an experience. It was so much work. What happened is they fired the first director. Uh, he just didn't have it. I don't know. And, and so they were going to shut it down. And then I said, you know, there's a director I worked with on Night Gallery, Janot Shork, who did all, more of Night Gallery than anybody. And mm -hmm. I said, he was great. He could always find a way of doing stuff. I said, um, you know, and if, if you hire a, a big name director like Otto Preminger, we have to start from the beginning. And if you want to shoot, show this next year, we've got to go with what we've got. And you know will. So that's basically how I got them not to fire and not to, to shut down Jaws 2, and I got you to know that. On 3, what happened was I was doing a picture called The Ninja mm -hmm. in uh, New York, and uh, I worked on it for about six or seven months, and it was a, a Fox picture, and Fox that got uh, sold to... Uh, somebody, I can't remember his name now, and he he canceled all the pictures that were not shooting yet. Mm -hmm. And I already built sets and all this. So I came back to L.A. and I went to see Verna Fields, who won the Academy Award for editing Jaws. And now she's a vice president. And I, she had an office next to her office. And a lot of us that knew her, we used to go in there and, and hang out and call Godly and me and whatever. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, she said, you know, Joe, they were, they, Jaws uh, was bought, the studio didn't, is that a, didn't want to do a third, a second sequel. So uh, this television producer bought the rights to it. Mm -hmm. um, Helen Cooper, no, uh, I think I admit it. Anyway, mm -hmm. so uh, they, they were going to do this picture called Jaws 3 People Zero. And it was to make fun of the people that did Jaws. And I says, are you serious? Their biggest picture and they're making fun of the people that did it? And so I think Spielberg found out about it. Joe Dante was going to direct it. And they, they, they canceled that. So she said, uh, why don't you go talk to the producer there and, and see if you could get involved with Jaws 3. So, um, anyway, I went over and talked to the producer, and he said, well, I don't know about directing, but why don't you go, we need a, a, a water park. Why don't you go with the, with the writer and see if you could find things that will decide about directing. So, um, Alan Ladsberg is, is the producer, I'm trying to think of his name. Oh, yeah. And he did cheap shows, uh, you know, small television show. So this is, mm. he was treating it like it was a small television movie. Anyway, I was um, with the uh, Richard, I uh, um, can't remember his name, the, the, the writer, and, and we went to these various water theme parks, uh, one in uh, Florida, and they had this show that you walked in, and it was uh, a 3D, it was in 3D with the glasses, and it was underwater, showing you all the underwater, you know, uh, or, uh, various uh, reed things. And uh, anyway, it, it, it was it was incredible going through the uh, in the, the underwater sequence in this thing. And so it came out and. He looked at me, he says, what do you think? And I said, he says, Jaws in 3D? I said, no, Jaws 3D. We, we just add the D to the 3, and it takes away, you know, the, uh, the, the idea of a second sequel. It's Jaws 3D. Mm -hmm. So I got back, and the studio, I made a drawing of the shark coming at us, and, you know, and the studio got all ex excited about it now, and Adam Landsberg, okay, you're going to direct it. And uh, and that's how that's how that happened. Yeah, the, the the kid you directed in the first Jaws, that was Jeffrey Voorhees, right? Yes. 
I talked to him a couple years ago. He owns an actual seafood restaurant where the the beach was in the movie. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll be there. Yeah. Oh, that was, uh, Martha's Vineyard was, was quite a thing, you know. Oh, yeah, and it still is. He says it's a, it's a big tourist attraction over there. Um, yeah, Jaws 3D was Leah Thompson's first movie. She was coming off of being a dancer. How did you find her? Well, she was about 19. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was, Rupert Hitzik was a, a, a producer that Alan Landsberg hired to, to work with me on it. And so we were doing, uh, you, you know, uh, casting uh, and uh, so we were interviewing all these various girls for that part and she came in and uh, I liked her I thought she was cute and she had a lot of energy and uh, they said they weren't interested in her so then we went to New York uh, and we were doing the casting there and she was a ballsy little girl she shows up again she says oh I thought you guys would want to see me again you know and so they said, you really like that girl? I said, yeah, I think she's going to be great. Okay, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's how she got uh, cast. And, and she was amazing how she learned how to water ski and climb up and do all that stuff. Mm-hmm. It was great. And, and I saw her a couple of years ago at one of these shows. Yeah. And uh, she... She, she was about 25 feet away from me when I saw her, and she didn't look any different then. Yeah. You know, she's like 50 now, whatever, you know, so many years. And she comes back, and uh, he comes running up, gives me a big hug, and yells out to everybody, this guy gave me my first job, you know. <laughs> so we talked, we flew back together, and so, yeah, a very, very nice girl. Yeah. She's directing, she, she's, uh, you know, the last time I talked to her, she was directing, so... Right. Stuff. Yeah, she was the first celebrity I ever met at a Comic Con uh, six years ago, and just the sweetest lady. She appreciates her fans a great deal. You yeah. Know? Yeah, she she is. And uh, John Putz was they were great together. Yeah. Now that next you do um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind with Spielberg, a very interesting sci-fi classic like no other. Uh, what are your memories of that movie? Jaws, he was doing some editing, I was finished with that, and we went up uh, water uh, skiing uh, in Mammoth. A good friend of mine, uh, Dick's mother, uh, had a, a condo there, so mm-hmm. he used Dick's condo, and uh, we were going to do Bingo Wong and his Traveling All-Stars. It was about black baseball. Oh, yeah. In the 30s. And uh, so I, you know, we didn't have... The internet, we didn't have where you can get all the information on your phone. We had research departments. So I went and I collected a lot of life magazines of the 30s that pertained to baseball and black baseball and whatever. So we went up there and we got stuck in the snow and we couldn't ski. The car broke down, whatever. So he starts, to, you know, we're talking about being along. And then he said, you know, I've been working on this thing called you know, Watch the Sky. And, uh, you know, it's about this big spaceship comes and lands and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, gosh, Stephen, that sounds more interesting than this black baseball movie. And he says, yeah, but I don't have a deal with it yet, you know. But So, uh, anyway, we got back home. Uh, I didn't hear from Stephen for a while. I got a call from John Batten, who I worked with mm-hmm. quite a bit on different television movies. And he said he was going to do, he was doing Being Along and his Traveling All-Stars. And I, I thought, that's funny. I guess Stephen's not doing it. And, uh, but I already signed to do Embryo with Rock Hudson. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I was, I was doing Embryo, and then Stephen called me, and he said, Joe, uh, you know, I've got a deal coming with this this uh, watch the sky and uh, so he sent me a script and I was finishing he said nobody was on the picture they didn't have a production manager they had nothing but it was going to be a, a, a Columbia release 
So John Veach was uh, head of production at Gorman. He said, go talk to John, and what you could do is, we need a very strange looking mountain. So if you could, you know, while we're getting everything set up, go look for a mountain. And I said, okay. So basically I met with John, and he said, well, we don't have anybody on it yet, but just go do what you have to do. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I talked to, I was back in Verna's office and I was looking, I had a map of uh, scenic USA and it had these various uh, 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 chimney rock and uh, uh, various interesting rock, you know, hills, mountains, whatever. So. Uh, and Carl said, oh yeah, this is good, and ship rock and whatever, and he said, oh, and maybe you should go look at Devil's Tower. Okay, so I, I had the whole thing planned out, and um, I drove to uh, South Dakota, look at, uh, you know, the, the back of the President's, uh, you know, Monument Valley thing. Mm-hmm. And and then I drove 3,000 miles, I rented a car there, and I went to Ship Rock and Chimney Rock and whatever. And then I got, drove forever to get to Devil's Tower. And when I got to Devil's Tower, it was just amazing. This incredible, weird shaped thing. And it, I, you know, it just had such a intriguing look about it. And in those days, what, you know, you, you took a, just bags of 35 millimeter, you know, film, uh, uh, 36 exposures, and you just, photograph you did pan shots then you came back and you got it you got them developed and then you put them on a on a big poster board so i laid out a, a few of them and without question steven said uh you know that devil's tower was it and so mm-hmm. by that time we started to get a crew Bill Mo sigman was a cameraman and uh, the, the various people. So we went up to Devil's Tower, and, and that's how that location started. And uh, then what happened was in this script, we've got this great mountain. Now we've got that established. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side of it, supposedly, is just a, a big area where they set up military encampment. So we just tents and things like that and the spaceship is supposed to come down on that side and i remember talking to steve and i said you know this is a very very important thing this this communication with a a spaceship Mm -hmm. i said wouldn't we have a lot of technical you know things to record it and stuff he says, yeah. I said, how about if I build a, a big arena and then we put all these technical things and light boards and stuff? He says, yes, I, oh, yeah, that'd be much more exciting. So this two, three million dollar uh, sci-fi movie, that's what it was going to be. Oh, just a couple million bucks. Mm-hmm. Very cheap, you know, for sci-fi movie. And so... What happened was, I said, okay, uh, I went to John Beach and I said, I want to build a, a big set. And it has to be enclosed because we're going to have all these visual effects. And so we can't have any light that we can't control. So he took me over to stage 15 and 16. He said, this is where they did Camelot. And you could have these two sets, they run together, and build your big set. I said, okay. I said, well, I think... It might be a little small. He said, what? This is the biggest set stage we've got. Yeah, he said, well, you know, now Jaws is becoming very big. Mm-hmm. And with that, we had a lot more power because the studio was having financial problems and they needed a big, successful movie. And now suddenly they got these young guys, so to speak, working on a sci-fi movie there. And and they, they just worked on a movie which is climbing up to the number one movie, you know, financially ever made. And so I, I, ma- I made a model and showed it to the 
executives, and that would fit in stage 15 and 16. And they said, uh, so what do you think? I said, I think it's a little small. I think it should be huge, because mm-hmm. this is such an important time, this event. So they said, how big? I said, well, four times this. So I made another model, four times that. And like 300, 300 feet wide, 450 feet long was the size of the, the set. And they said, okay, great, this is where you're gonna do it. And Clark Palo was really a nice guy. He was a production manager, very, very much on my side as well. So anyway, we had no clue. I, I I designed this set and I didn't have a clue where to shoot it. Mm-hmm. So we started looking for airplane hangars from World War II. We looked at one in Oregon. Clark and I just traveled there. And it was great, except they had a big, like a lumber uh, cutting thing connected to it. So it made too much noise. So we can't have them cutting this lumber and shoot a movie here. So then we went to one in Colorado, no, it was in, uh, oh, the East Coast, uh, another big hangar. They, they made these World War II hangars with these big Zeppelins, you know? And uh, so these these enclosed were, were big, but then they had other things involved in it, so that didn't work. Finally, I found in Mobile, Alabama, two hangars, and they were 300 foot square, but they opened up uh, so you could extend it. So I was able to extend the the hangar 150 feet with a big black tarp. It was huge, and it took us like five months to build the set. It was the biggest set at that time mm-hmm. ever built in the Guinness Book of Rec- Records. And then I think uh, there was a, b- a bigger one later uh, uh, in England. Um, in any case, uh, that's that's how it started. And so from this small, cheap little TV, not TV, but sci-fi movie, it expanded into this huge thing. And uh, that's how it started. Yeah, is Richard Dreyfus a barrel of laughs on set? He's such a funny guy. A barrel of laughs? Yeah. Uh, he was uh, a little more difficult, I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I... We did have a problem in... Mm-hmm. We were down in the South, and we had the Ku Klux Klan there. Oh. And they were doing marches and stuff, and Richard's mouthed off about them and it got really dangerous and so we had to make sure we were careful not to because he was just opening his mouth about the, you know the people there and yeah you know it, it was very dicey yeah being jewish didn't help him either <laughs> probably yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean i think this was the first movie that portrayed aliens as one of us and not necessarily the enemy you, we wanted them to just be these little kids, you know. And I, I, I have, I had a, a Close Encounters book that I released, and I, I did some some sketches and some aliens, and uh, and the, we we made little faces for them, and, but we used little girls, mm-hmm. five six year old girls, because they were the way they moved and. And it was small, and that worked out. Later, in post-production, they added this weird creature that came out of there. And that was sort of a shock to me why Stephen did that. It was an afterthought. And it, it sort of, why have this ugly guy come out and walk around when we had all these cute little kids in it? You know? Right. Anyway. So then you start working with Carpenter on uh, Escape from New York. I, I think you did a great job with the alternate New York. Um, it's very comparable to the, the L.A. and uh, Blade Runner a year later because they both had a real like futuristic noir feel to it. Um, how was working on that film? That was incredible. Uh, what happened was after... Closer cars after 
Jaws 2, and I, I directed 80, over 80 days of second unit on Jaws 2. I mean, it was just so much. So I really had a plan of, I wanted to, to direct. And so what happened was, um, with Bill Gilmore, he was a production manager on, uh, on Jaws. And uh, we be, became friends, and he had a company he was working for. And ha having uh, raced cars, I, I raced formula cars, and I, I won the Pacific Coast Championship in my class. So I was, and I raced at Daytona and stuff. Anyway, uh, I had a, a script about Formula One racing. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so we went and scouted all the racetrack to Formula One and came back and his company had been sold to somebody else so that project was canceled. And uh, so I had a couple other projects that uh, never happened. Uh, and so then my, my, my father died, everything was really bad. And my agent, Phil Gurr, said, you gotta go back and design a movie. You know, you, you haven't you've been trying to direct this thing for a year or so now, and nothing's happening. So I said, yeah, okay. So he said, I wanted you to meet these two young people. Uh, 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 Deborah Hill mm -hmm. and John uh, Carpenter. So I, I met them. And Deborah was really a go-getter. She's just ready to do this and that. But then John was sort of a laid-back guy. But we had a good communication. So basically, uh, what happened was, I just, my training and my experience is, we gotta get moving, we gotta make this thing. And I said, well, it's in the script, we need a bridge that, that ends, that goes, nobody uses, uh, we need, to see New York and, and saw beat up. So um, Larry Franco was the first assistant and John and I went to the trade towers. We got on top of the trade towers. Of course, they don't exist anymore. And we looked at New York and said, oh, this, is, this could be too difficult. So we came back and uh, Barry Bernardi was the location guy. I said, Barry, we gotta start finding the, the bridge or something. I'm just such a, go get her kind of thing, I, I can't sit around. I, well, let's find what we need. So we looked for bridges and we found a a bridge in St. Louis that nobody used. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, oh, and I could build a wall here and it would be perfect. And then we looked at the downtown uh, in, in St. Louis and they were rebuilding a lot of it, a lot of it was torn down. And I said, God, this looks, we could make New York out of this. And then they had an old train station, which was great. So I brought John and that was great. So that's how we ended up doing New York in St. Louis. And mm -hmm. we, we did the bridge, we did, you know, it, it just all worked out so well. How so uh, then we were shooting that and I had a good relationship with Deborah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's a good friend, and she, she was dating my friend, Dick's mother, and, and uh, she'd come over the house and hang out. And uh, so then we needed, we were talking about, we needed visual effects. And uh, I went, God, I can't remember his name now, did the visual effects for uh, Star Wars. Um, and we talked to him about doing the effects for... Uh, <clears throat> came from New York mm -hmm. and he said it would cost whatever and we came out of the meeting and she said oh, that's crazy we, we can't afford it I mean, in other words the, the movie Escape from New York had a budget of six million there are other movies uh, Halloween and whatever the biggest budget they had was 300,000 right so this was huge to them but it wasn't very huge to me having done close encounters and whatever. Uh, so my thinking was a little different, you know, I was thinking a little bigger. Um, and so it was interesting. We needed to do effects, uh, miniatures and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I went to, 
to a party, uh, a friend of mine, Guy Magar, who was directing some small movies. And he had hired this illustrator to do some creatures for him. And he was at the party. And I was talking to him about this movie I was on. And uh, I said, we're trying to find effects. He said, oh, I, I work for a company. We could do the effects. And that was Jim Cameron. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, so Jim was an illustrator there. And uh, so he he was working at uh, Rolly Art. No, at, uh, I can't think of the name. I got all these names. But uh, a small company that he was, you know, doing things for. So... Um, I'll think about it in a minute. Anyway, we liked what he had in mind, so he ended up doing the special effects. So uh, my relationship with Jim Cameron is that I hired him. And then, of course, he went to be pretty well-known, you know. Yeah, of course. Um, how about Starman? Starman uh, was... Uh, John wanted me to design it and I had some directing things online and I said I will do uh, be a visual consultant and I designed a spaceship there and I'll direct the second unit so basically that's what I, my involvement was uh, finding locations and doing a, a second unit car driving from wherever it was Illinois to to uh, uh, the, the big uh thing in Arizona, the uh, uh, landing site, it was uh, some kind of crater there. Mm. And uh, so that's basically my involvement, uh, was uh, consulting visually and doing this, this uh, second, the uh, second unit directing. Yeah, it's kind of a, um, it happened one night meets E.T. story, you know? Yeah. I, th I think it's one of Carpenter's absolute best. Um, yeah, it was good. John was interesting to work for. You know, uh, I would set up, he, he had very little ego. Uh, I, I would set up a shot. We had a shot where there, we had a, a airplane burning. And mm. uh, I said, we're going to start the fire here. It comes here. So then... He said, okay, John, what are we shooting? And he said, oh, Joe's shots. Just, you know. Yeah. So we, we had that kind of relationship. Uh, that's awesome. So what are you doing these days? What do I do these days? Uh, I do a lot of sculptures. Mm -hmm. I have maybe, God, I don't know, big sculptures, small sculptures, mainly wood and, uh, and carving foam and clay and I have in, um, in my living room when I look out I have these mermaids I said a lot of mermaids uh, I had an interview here from a lady from Switzerland she looked at my mermaids she said oh softer side of jaws <laughs> uh, so yeah and you know what's interesting is I never got much mail or interest in jaws until this century Wow. And now it's, it, I, there's not a, a week that goes by that I don't get two or three, you know, would you sign this, would you sign that? Some of them are ripoffs. They'll send me like a dozen things. Would you sign these and not endorse it to anybody? And, and they're ripoffs because then they want to sell them, you know. Of course. So I have to be careful. I, I mean, I'm still, you know, I, I'm not making any money off of that. And, uh, when I do the shows, I do, but I, we haven't done any shows with the pandemic, you know. Yeah. So. But that's the power of the Internet, though, you know. I mean, once the Internet came, you know, people became aware of who was what on what movie, and then, you know, the, the Comic-Cons and everything exploded, and now, you know, people who never would have done Comic-Cons 30, 40 years ago are now doing them. Yeah, it's a, it's a total different thing. And, uh, you know, as I say, uh, every day on the mail I get something which you sign, which you sign. Because they've got my address. I don't know how the hell they got it, I guess, online somehow. But Yeah, that's, anyway. a, that's weird. Uh, do you have a sculpting gallery? No. No, I don't sell anything. I, I, I give some away to good friends. And my house is a gallery. But God, if you, <laughs> stuff is all over it, you know. But it, no, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, it, it consumes time and your thoughts. And uh, I, I mean, I'm, I don't have any interest in, 
and doing a film anymore, you know. Right. But I do lectures. I did, uh, I drove to uh, Arizona uh, and did a, it was a, a University of Arizona, a friend of mine is teaching a class there in motion pictures. And uh, so I went there and I, I did a couple hours, you know, talking to the kids. And it was interesting, he said, there were just three or four of the class that asked me questions, which was very unusual, because I, what I've done it before, before the pandemic, I had all these questions. How do you do this? How do you? And there were like only three or four questions. And it, 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 the, the guy that was teaching the class, he was blown away. He said, this is stupid. These kids are dumb. They, they just get what they have on their phone and they don't research. Yeah. You know, they're not interested in what happened before. You know, it's just crazy. It is. It's a crazy time for that, you know. And you would think it would be the other way around because they have this um, access, but, like, they just don't utilize it. They have such a short attention span. Oh, yeah. You know, I got the Art Directors Guild gave me a Lifetime Achievement Award mm -hmm. two years ago. And they asked, well, we, 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 it, was, it was a big deal, was, uh, you know, tux, you know, ties, white, black, black ties and all that, and, uh, tuxedos, and about a thousand people there. And so it was a big dinner, and they said, oh, we want somebody to, to introduce you. And I said, well, so many of them are dead. Bill Gilmore's dead. And, you know, the various people that I worked with close, they said, how about Spielberg? I said, oh, well, he's, he's doing the movie in, uh, in New York. I, I can't bother Steven. And so I was working with Greg Nicotero. He 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 did the forward to the book. Yeah. And, uh, and so Greg said, "Oh, I'll be happy to introduce you." So uh, Greg was introducing me, and in the background they were showing film clips of movies I worked with. And then they stopped, and who comes on the screen but Steven Spielberg? <laughs> and he goes and says how great our relationship was, and you know blah blah blah. And it was just wonderful working with you, and you know. And I was blown away because it's been so long since we, you know, worked together or anything that he would take the time to film this, you know, which he did. And uh, that was quite a thrill. Anyway, when I was giving a speech, I was telling the uh, <coughs> art directors there, and I said, you know, when I did. did uh, 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 the uh, uh, scouting for Devil's Tower. I said, you know, I drove 3,000 miles to find the right location. I said, but today you can just Google it. You guys wouldn't travel. You just Google, give me, show me strange looking mountains. Mm -hmm. I said, but <clears throat> what you do is you lose all that time seeing other things. And what happened is when I was in Arches Park, it didn't work for uh, Close Encounters, but it did work later for Geronimo. So it, it, it was just a different time, you know? Right. So now there's a shortcut to get someplace. And the old days, it took longer, but you were getting different information that maybe you could use later. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, absolutely. And this book, uh, Designing Jaws, what made you want to write it? Well, Dennis Prince wrote it. He, he's, he, he wrote for uh, Hewlett Packard. He wrote about, I think, 14, 15 uh, technical books. And I was doing a show in uh, Louisiana, uh, in uh, Kentucky. And he, he was also involved in some model makeup things. And we flew back together. And uh, he said, oh, you know, we'd like to talk to you about doing uh, maybe a book about what you've done. Anyway, it, he ended up doing a small book on Close Encounters. Uh, and then uh, they had a thing in, uh, 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 I'm thinking of the island, uh, Catalina. They had a, a Jaws show mm -hmm. for six months. And uh, so we did a, a book on Jaws and then elaborated or made it more. And, and they had two different things from uh, the, from Jaws that were there. Uh, so so that's, that was it. It was somebody else. But it, what, what happened basically, Tom, is, is that mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I saved everything. You know, the studio used to throw away all the illustrations. Who wants these old things? I was there one time and they were dumping all these old drawings from, uh, like, uh, Frankenstein. I said, well, you guys just dump it now. Nobody needs these things. Well, they do now. They're worth a lot. But I saved every drawing I had, every sketch, every rough thing, and just dumped it into a, you know, big box. And so when he started doing the book, he just, he had so much to work with, you know, all the storyboards, all the original sketches. And so, and now he's he's working on a, uh, a biography, you know, on all the movies I worked on, so we'll see when that gets done. Oh, that's awesome. I look forward to that, and I'll definitely pick up a copy of Designing Jaws. It's on uh, Amazon and your website? Yeah, just Amazon, yeah. You can get it on Amazon. Spectacular. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time today. I'm glad that Curtis could connect us, and I hope okay. I hope you and uh, Jerry have a happy holiday season, and be safe out there. All right. Take care, Tom. Thank you, sir. All right, Tom. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Joe Alves, ain't he a cool dude? A nice guy, huh? Great stories there about all the movies he worked on, and he still loves telling them, and he loves doing what he does. Wow, sculpting. They they must be beautiful, those school sculptures. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Layer dudes.